there's been a lot of governing going on. And the way that you can tell that there's been a lot of governing going on is the entire right-wing media sphere is ate up with wokeness and a fear of a socialist future. And the fact that they are hammering this on and on and on is because they are deathly afraid of attacking the actual bills put forth by the Biden administration or Democrats in Congress, the ones that actually have a chance at passing, not, not the outliers, you know, the, the Democrat equivalent of the Marjorie Taylor Greene impeaching Joe Biden kind of things that are, you know, either like publicity pieces where you release something or it's not actually got any actionable stuff in it quite yet, but it's a, you know, it's like a statement of purpose, like a mission statement kind of a bill. Um, which I would count the Green New Deal as part of that because it doesn't actually, while it has some prescriptions and some ideas, it doesn't actually have any budgetary allocations or any of that stuff in there. It's more like this is what we need to be doing. You know, it, it has all the legislative power of making something National Ice Cream Day. It doesn't change whether or not people, you know, it doesn't force people to buy ice cream. It just reminds them that ice cream is there once a year as if they needed to be reminded. But um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a ton of governance going on and that's how you can, and the way you can tell is by how Fox News is ate up with the, you know, the, the hack of the pipeline that caused a gas shortage on the East Coast because Donald Trump fired the head of CISA because he wouldn't agree that the election was stolen and he kneecapped all of our cybersecurity stuff all during his presidency because it seemed to always poke um, it, at Cozy Bear and uh, and Fancy Bear and the the GRU's Macedonian hacker farms that they put together, and it was always no matter what, all the trails all seemed to lead to Vladimir Putin. So basically, um, Trump just decided to call off the dogs as best he could with the, with whatever limited power he had in that arena, and he was fairly successful. And this hack has been ongoing. And the shutdown, the ransomware part of it has to do with whether or not they paid during a period of time. But it's the result yeah. of basically pantsing our cybersecurity over the last three years, particularly. Right. And and this and, and basically to protect himself, if we have the ability to look at, you know, foreign actors interfering with our country, they will recognize that. When it does happen, it seems to strangely benefit Donald Trump and his flunkies. Um, we will deal with that in a moment, but uh, but I also want to talk about some of the the actual governance that's going on during this whole thing. Um, this is uh, you know a, a major you know element, and somebody had a question about the CDC guidelines about the mask thing. Um, it's it, you know, and we'll get to that as well. But we have a caller on the line. I want to get to that early so that I don't. Leave them hanging yeah, yeah. for a long time. Who do we have first, Lady B? Uh, we have Ken from uh, Florida. Excellent. Welcome, Ken, Ken from Florida. How are you? I'm doing fine now. How about you? Solid. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, so my question uh, comes from the chat room over on Facebook. They wanted to know what you thought about um, uh, Biden's take on... Uh, the Israel situation, and mm -hmm. uh, it surprises me because I did a little research while I was waiting for this call, and I was surprised to find that he doesn't actually have someone uh, to handle that issue yet. No one's been nominated. Well, they have um, they have a State Department. They, I mean, there's no, I don't know if you're talking about a direct, like an Israeli ambassador. Is that what you mean? Because yeah. the, sta the State Department is the one that negotiates in those parts. The ambassador wouldn't be doing this on that part, especially at this high level. Ambassadorships oftentimes are for the low-res parts of diplomacy. They're not the ones who, you know, negotiate ceasefires and the like. That takes the full brunt of the, of the government. So the State Department has been talking. This, this came out last week and maybe or even late the week before when, this real, when the flare-up really started to happen, was that the U.N. wanted to issue a statement that the U.S. felt, you know, that the Biden administration felt was imbalanced in how it was approaching it, and that they were working with both, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian leaders and the Israeli government to try and negotiate a, a, a ceasefire or a slowing down of aggression on both sides equally, instead of just trying to talk Israel into not re retaliating, which seems to be the direction that the UN was going. 
and and the U.S. was saying there's no way the, I that Israel will do that if missiles continue to fly from uh, from Gaza towards Israel. There's no. They're just. This is how the escalation starts. So they have been negotiating. We, as the United States, our government has been negotiating with both sides for the last week and a half since the beginning of this flare-up and trying to get both sides to step back away from this escalated violence, which was, you know, triggered by this, uh, you know, everyone saying because of this, uh, a way a road is routed around the, the mosque there. But in reality, is just an extension of the ongoing violence that we've seen for decades. It is really just, uh, you know, a, 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 the, the match that lit it off. So, the fact that we don't currently have an Israeli ambassador has no impact whatsoever on our relationship with Israel currently and our ability to negotiate in good faith with the Israelis and the Palestinians, if that makes any sense. The State Department is all in on these kind of things. The ambassador, while they are important and it's more of an ongoing managerial relationship thing that's what our ambassadors do they at no point negotiate ceasefires on behalf of the u.s government and in no way talk about the the funding that comes for, you know and goes for like iron dome missiles and the like which is what what you know was one of the concerns are we going to replenish the missiles used in the iron dome that israel is using to defend themselves but that's unequivocally yes the, you know, the defensive missile capability is the thing we want to play up while playing down any offensive uh, attacks to try and help bring it down. So that ultimately what you have is if the Palestinians do fire missiles, they are uh, being shot out of the sky. They're not landing and killing anybody, including the 20 percent of Arabs that live in, uh, in Israel and in that region who are in danger of being killed by these stray missiles as well. And that Israel doesn't retaliate by firing on them. Um, you know, in exchange for missiles that do get through. So that, and that we over time ratchet this down. Again, these are not, as much as we pay for Israel and we give a, a lot of uh, support to them, neither of these are our territories. These are, this is not the U.S. Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico or even Guam in that regard. We don't have abject control over either of these territories. Everything we do is a matter of negotiation. And negotiation at a level where people are currently bombing each other is, uh, is always going to be ice skating uphill. It, is, it will take more time than, you know, than the, the extremity of the circumstance that's going. So it, does that make sense? Yes, it does, Hal. I can't help but think that the same Republicans who want to stand in the way of everything Biden does would simply not allow him to pick somebody anyway. Right. Yeah. It, well, that, it, that, is, that is certainly true with all of our ambassadorships. They, these should be, and, and I agree that this should happen on both sides, unless there's a reason in particular why somebody like, let's just say, Louis DeJoy um, shouldn't be anywhere near the reins of power that they're having. Um, most of it, most of as far as the, the cabinet goes and most of where the, uh, you know, the ambassadorships, with rare exception, should be largely rubber stamped by Congress unless there's a standout reason why they have concerns. Right now, the... Quite frankly, the Republicans only, they have no legislative priorities. They have no gift to give the American people as members of our, you know, our representative government. They have nothing to offer. What they are doing and what they are the party of doing right now is riding the parking brake. That's it. That right now, literally, all Mitch McConnell has is pull the parking brake and hold it up all the time um, because the and, and not for the reasons like what they're present, what the Democrats are presenting is so egregious and off the charts. The problem the Republicans have, and this is a serious problem for both 2022 and 2024, is that 60% of Republicans like what Biden is presenting. 60% of Republicans like the major bills that are getting through, that are being shepherded by the administration and specifically by leadership in the Senate and by Nancy Pelosi. Beyond all the like, oh my God, we're turning into a socialist republic and blah, 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 and that's what they're shooting for. Um, you know, any kind of fringe bills that might get put to the floor. The reality is the stuff that's making it through committee and going through the slog of democracy and it's turning into sausage as the sausage is being made, Americans like the sausage once it's made. And that's a problem 
for Mitch McConnell. It's, it's deadly to their party. So if it gets done, when this infrastructure bill gets through, and it will, by the way, they might carve out some of the health care stuff or split it in half, but ultimately that's all, that entire bill can be done with reconciliation because that is government funding. That is taxes taken in and going out the door. And so every aspect of that infrastructure bill can be passed in, in, uh, uh, through re uh, reconciliation with the exception of possibly some of the health care bill stuff which are support-based. They may have fit better into the earlier uh, rescue package, technically speaking, because it was covering on health care. But they might still be able to. That's the debatable part. But even if they broom that out, Mitch McConnell's big problem and all the Republicans' problem is that this bill will be incredibly popular and by this time next year, we'll be dumping funds into a lot of red districts, giving them a lot of really necessary infrastructure bumps, including bridges, um, you know, fixing roads, and specifically moving broadband in. That's the big fear that a lot of them have because it will be the most, I mean, that is, the Biden broadband infrastructure is going to be ultimately his version of the highway system. You know, because we had freeways on either side of the country, but connecting them through the center was the big move of the highway bill, right? And that's this is all this is Biden doing an an absolute equivalency in terms of information and technology, and it's and it cannot. You, you have to understand that the middle of America has been living, um, you know, scrapping at in at the internet for years. And now they'll have an opportunity to have equal internet to the coasts, which will be incredible. We got to take a break. Appreciate the call. We'll be back right after this. I totally rode right through that break, but it was a good conversation to have and yeah. good stuff to talk about. We'll be back right after this. It's the House Parks Radio Program, Mega Worldwide.